Uh, hi everyone, welcome to the Ideas uh, uh, AI seminar series. So today's seminar, uh, we are very pleased to have uh, Professor Sidney DiMello from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, he's an associate professor in the Institute of Cognitive Science and the Department of Computer Science uh, there. His work lies in the intersection of computing, cognitive, uh, effective social and learning sciences, and he's interested in the dynamic interplay between cognition and emotion. So he has uh, co-edited seven books, published uh, more than 300 journal papers, uh, with multiple awards at international conferences, and his work has been funded by numerous grants. Uh, most notably, he's also uh, the uh, uh, leader of the Institute, NSF AI Institute on student AI teaming, which was recently announced. So we are very pleased to uh, welcome Sydney to our uh, seminar series, and he'll be talking about understanding human functioning and enhancing human potential through computational methods. So, uh, well, I'm glad to be here. Um, uh, it's, uh, I actually have a project with some folks in Georgia Tech and I spent, spent some great time there. Um, and I uh, would always love to be there in person, uh, maybe sometime uh, in the future. Uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, some of the work we've been doing and how these kind of ideas of our research program align with uh, the, uh, uh, the Institute. So. Uh, generally speaking, uh, let me just start with some kind of central claims. Um, one, uh, we're interested in human functioning from the perspective of cognition, emotion, and social interaction. So uh, this is not so much about physical health or even mental health. It's more about thinking, feeling, uh, doing, and interacting. Um, and, uh, you know, we've learned a lot uh, about these complex phenomena from, you know, observational and experimental methods. Uh, that's kind of the bread and butter of cognitive psychology, analytic approaches, um, you know, observational studies, uh, where you corpus studies and so on, uh, a great deal from instrumentation, um, and also traditional computational methods. Um, for example, uh, that model, that easy reader, is, is an amazing model of eye movements during reading, right? Um, and it's actually a very mechanistic model, in fact. Uh, they've basically worked on all the equations, and the model is really just a computational instantiation of the equations of how ocular motor, motor control works. So uh, we've, 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 we've done a bunch. Um, I think, though, that um, when we get into really thorny phenomena and in ec ecological context, um, this, you know, the central claim is that we can computational models, and a specific type, which I want to talk about, is more like machine-learned computational models, um, where you kind of have a vague idea of the theory, but you're nowhere near uh, being able to specify uh, mechanisms uh, or even even know what the pertinent variables are to the point at which you can actually you know run a traditional model. Uh, so so uh, th these models are essential when there's no adequate theoretical or mechanistic account. So to give you an example, um, uh, one classic example is um, how do you know how do um, how do your eyes move uh, when you are uh, how do your eyes move uh, in the context of social interaction, right? So there's just too many variables. Um, second, sometimes you just have too much data or data is too complex. Uh, and I'll show you in a couple of examples. If you even consider three people interacting or two people interacting, the number of degrees of freedom, if you really consider all possible channels, uh, becomes just computationally intractable. So, so it's, it's not even possible to instantiate a proper model without making major simplifying assumptions. Uh, and these models, if they're constructed correctly, can provide some insights, with caveats, of course, into the underlying phenomena. So uh, you can use the models to learn something about what you're interested in. Um, and they can promote change through dynamic intervention, right? So if you have a model, you have something physical, it's a tangible object, uh, whereas the theory is more abstract. And now you can do something with it. You can, you know, you can embed it in a robotic system. You, you can embed it in a computer interface. Uh, so, so it's not just, so this is lovely blend of both science and engineering. And of course, how you construct them is really important. Um, and just two points, again, on, on our approach to constructing these models is, one, we really want to study the phenomena in relatively ecologically valid context. And that doesn't mean you always have to go out in the lab and in the wild. You can, you can construct pretty much reasonable situations in the lab when warranted. So to draw a distinction, uh, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about eye tracking and reading later. Uh, you might be surprised to know that maybe 90% of the research on reading doesn't involve reading actual text. 
right? So you're reading words or you're reading sentences. So that's something we would, you know, consider not not the context we want to study, right? We want to study people engaging in authentic materials. Um, and second, uh, you know, we're not interested in, for our purposes, in, you know, getting the most accurate model or the most generalizable model. So, uh, you know, running three weeks of GPU and, you know, a billion uh, layers. And because th the point is that the models should have some constraints by and be guided by a theoretical understanding of the phenomena, but but not not being too restricted by it. So and the, and the reason is because the theories that we're trying to understand are very incomplete. So it's the it's it's this challenge of striking this balance between you you want to do you want to stay consistent with theory and an understanding. And when I say theory here, I mean psychological theory for what you're interested in. Uh, uh, but but it can be quite constraining because our understanding is very limited. So so when understanding is limited, then people then then the, the natural inclination is to simplify things. Uh, but then you're not really studying the phenomena anymore. So it's this it's this kind of tricky. Uh, chicken and egg problem. So I'll ground these with some examples. Um, so the kind of research approach we take uh, is what I'd like to call it unapologetically pluralistic in the sense that, uh, you know, we try not to look at a problem from the perspective of a methodology, like as a theorist, as a machine learning person, as an empiricist, as an experimentalist, but really look at the phenomena and trigger and, and analyze it from different ways and what is what's needed. So this involves, We'll do quite a bit of observational and experimental research. Um, so very basic stuff in the lab, in the wild, control experiments. Sometimes they are psychophysics experiments. It, it doesn't matter. But then, uh, you know, whatever data we collect, we, we feel that, um, you know, and I, I think this is, you know, speaking to the choir here or preaching to the choir here, but when you, when you instantiate a model of some sort, it really offers new explanations and different ways to test your theories than you can ever do with, with, with basic experiments, right? Because, because models will fall apart and you can simulate things. So, so we always say when you have your data uh, or you have an understanding that's good enough, construct a model and, you know, and let it run. And then again, you know, when you have a model and you can do things with it, so we like to embed the models in some real time closed loop intelligent technology. So, uh, that said, um, I would say um, our work kind of blends uh, the psychological and computational sciences. And in the psychological sciences, the, the, the areas that we're interested in, cognitive psychology, uh, you know, how people think and make decisions, affective science about emotions, learning sciences, how people learn, social psychology, uh, how people interact, uh, a lot of work on team sciences and discourse. How do people perceive the world in a narrative form? Um, and in the computational sciences, the areas I've worked on uh, are affective computing, computing involving emotion, attentional computing, focusing on attention, uh, multimodal interaction, uh, neurophysiological sensing. This is where you try to couple uh, brain imaging uh, with behavioral uh, and physiological signals. Um, and the main areas are human computer interaction and machine learning. So I would say, going back to this diagram, kind of the work on the, you know, the top two observational and experimental research and then instantiating models of that would fall more into the cognitive science, you know, from a traditional disciplinary perspective. And this part, the model and the, uh, in the, the technologies and the interfaces that would fall more into HCI, so human community interaction. So really it's the model that kind of connects the base, the more, the more foundational basic research and the more like use case uh, work. So, uh, just to give you a quick overview, I, I know in, in the interest of time, I'll just, just, uh, split these. So we've done work in a lot of areas, uh, starting with computational models of cognition, uh, attentional array computing, eye tracking, um, and each of these, uh, you know, several year research programs. Um, but, uh, what I want to talk about today is just two illustrative examples, um, are, uh, one is really understanding um, eye movements uh, and what they tell us while people read. Uh, so this is very much a, uh, you know, one person and a text, right? Uh, and now at first blush, uh, you may see, well, how interesting can that be? Actually, it, it is uh, shockingly interesting because um, uh, how, people, how people navigate a text uh, is, is kind of fascinating. And the variability you get is, is absolutely amazing which you don't get, by the way, with richer media. So, for example, if you look at how people, uh, you know, watch film, you you get very, very uh, homogenous patterns because these film people have manipulated your attention to such a point 
that there's absolutely no, um, there's absolutely no, uh, sorry, there a phone call. Uh, there's absolutely no uh, variability. So that's that's one uh, piece. And then the second thing, just going in a different direction, is looking at uh, multimodal, multi-party modeling of collaborative discourse. How uh, people come together in over Zoom, like all of us are doing today. Uh, to solve some kind of complex problem or actually do some goal-directed activity and uh, what is the data we can collect in these contexts and how can we kind of understand and navigate that. So, um, okay, so uh, that said, so let me just get into the first kind of question, uh, the, first, the first project, and this is work that I started when I was at Notre Dame uh, with the team to the left and then I moved to Boulder and that's the middle team and then now it's the, now we're getting into more of the Kind of working with more neuroscientists and that's the kind of right team so uh typically if you we all are doing we all read right if you're looking at a typical reading study and you're looking at patterns during reading you know you may you may see initially something like this um where people are you know able to pretty much stay on task um but then a, but then a little later on um you know it gets harder and harder to focus attention and um, you know this is quite common, right? It's it's really difficult to sustain attention uh, without a lot of external stimulation. And um, so one way to think about this uh, is um, how do you figure out what somebody's attending to? So just just so you know, attention is uh, attention is basically the way in which we figure out what part of the world we focus on at a moment. So in any given moment in time, your brain is trying to solve just two problems: one, what to attend to. And second, what do I do next? So it is believed that every 150 milliseconds, you're kind of making this decision uh, in what sometimes we call a cognitive atom or a cognitive cycle. So it's just it's just occurring outside of your awareness, but that's happening all the time. So you can look at the direction of attention uh, as saying, okay, am I focusing on the focal activity? And let's assume in this case, it's looking at a computer screen or working with a computer screen, or is it elsewhere, right? So that's rather an objective measure. But then the question becomes, what are you thinking? And that is something that's very hard to measure. And you could actually be having a goal to read, thinking about the task that you're doing. So if I'm reading, for example, uh, are my thoughts about the text? Right now you're listening to me, you're watching this, uh, this talk. Uh, are you actually reflecting on the words I'm saying or are you thinking about something else? And it could be goal unrelated. And uh, to make a long story short, there are some easy cases uh, when you're thinking about the content or the goal and you're looking towards the stimulus, and we call that overt attention and there's different types. And then you could just be distracted and off task. The harder cases are the off, di off main diagonal, uh, when, for example, you actually are thinking about the goal, but it looks like you're not. So this occurs many times when people, when, when uh, students or people are, you know, looking into the sky, and it's really impossible to tell, are they actually daydreaming, or are they thinking very deeply? But what I want to talk to you about today is a, a different type, when all signs point to the fact that the person is attending. But in fact, their thoughts are, have triggered away into off-task thinking, so completely unrelated. And in colloquially, you know, we call this daydreaming or zoning out, but uh, the, the kind of term we use scientifically is mind one. So uh, why focus on mind wandering? So uh, in the context of learning, which I'm gonna talk about, but it has implications for human performance and all kinds of uh, military, vigilance tasks, all kinds of context. Um, this is a meta-analysis of studies we've done in our own lab. So just uh, a meta-analysis, basically a single study tells you nothing. Uh, so to really figure something out, you have to compile studies across many contexts and then, and then you can estimate what's called a mean effect. So this is a mini meta-analysis because this is not where we've looked at the whole literature. These are just studies we've done over the last 10 years on mind wandering. And this analysis looked at 25 studies from about almost 3,000 people in a variety of learning contexts, text, video, technology, video game, audio book, like you can, anything you imagine. And essentially the finding is pretty consistent um, that on average, you mind wander about 30% of the time. And, uh, and the way mind wandering is measured in these studies, by the way, is uh, through what's called a probe cut method. As you're performing a task, you get a thought probe and you respond, zone out or not. So it is self-report. Or it is what's called self cut right? We've all done this. You may, you may have many times in this talk just realize, oh, your thoughts just totally drifted away, which is totally normal. Uh, and that's called a self cut Now, uh, we can, uh, and the reason we rely on um, initially rely on self-report for this is for one there's like no objective measure 
there's no area in the brain you can measure and say this person is mind wandering. Um, that just doesn't exist. And second, uh, or we don't know of yet. And second, uh, because mind wandering is actually a subjective conscious experience, it's really about uh, what you're conscious of. This is why actually self reports can can be quite reliable, and there's and there's a lot of data validating those. But in addition to occurring frequently, it actually negatively correlates with learning outcomes. Um, so that's a negative point to it correlation across these studies. And you'll notice, and, and one thing to note in, in, in psychology and in the psychological sciences, that's like a moderate correlation. You, you rarely ever get a correlation that exceeds like 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Uh, so typically correlations in, in this field go from about you know, 0 0.1 to about 0 0.5. Um, again, of course, that all varies. So. We uh, actually came up with a theoretical model to uh, explain uh, why why the mind would wander, um, and we had a lot, a lot of empirical studies uh, to support the model, right? Um, so, I'll, but I won't get into those for the purpose of uh, today's talk. Um, I'll just uh, tell you like one study just to give you a sense of what happens. Um, so, in one study, they read this book. It's like the second most boring book on the internet. Um, it's about surface tension and liquids. I think it's actually kind of cool. Um, and then they also watch this balloon, this this movie, sorry, this is a very classic movie in narrative comprehension studies uh, where it's about this boy and there's this red balloon and so on and so forth. So as they're doing that, so this is kind of what the, what the stimulus looks like. They either read for 20 minutes and then watch the movie for 20 minutes or vice versa. And it's a very simple design. They, they, have, they have no interruption, they're reading, they're watching, and whenever they catch themselves mind wandering, like you're like, oh, what, what just happened? They basically uh, immediately type out what they thought, right? So, and then actually you can analyze the content of those thoughts in many ways to really, really figure out what's happening. Um, and here's an example. So first thing is they, um, you know, the thought was the lure. So that's something, that's a, that's uh, was something in the in the text. That that word triggered a memory and the memory was, haha, last time I was in the lure, I threw up in front of the Mona Lisa. So, so a word in the text, basically activated a memory that was unrelated to the text and then took people, and then that's why we call it wandering, because these thoughts just zoom around without really any direction in sight, right? So, um, and this is just one example, there's many, many things that may occur and why it's so really hard, why it's so difficult to concentrate. So this model kind of explains the different sources and different ways and what happens and, and so on and so forth. There's one thing I wanna point out though, um, and that's, this uh, I, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there's this uh, when you when you mind wander, you engage in what's called perceptual and cognitive decoupling. So what happens is you're processing the stimulus. If you track people's eye movements, which I'll show you in a second, it looks like everything is fine. However, what is being encoded in, in, in the mind is, is nothing. So it's you're completely decoupled. So you're moving in this automatic fashion but nothing is actually being encoded, which is why you actually don't really comprehend anything. So this is why you get this negative correlation. Uh, so in, just to give you an example, in a classic study, in one, not a classic, one of my favorite studies, they had people read one word at a time, and then you know you read a word, you hit the space bar, get the next word, word by word reading. And at some point, the text would just turn to gibberish, so you're just reading nonsense. But when people are mind wandering, it took them 17 words on average to realize that they are reading gibberish, right? So this is exactly this idea of uh, decoupling. Um, so one challenge with mind wandering and these phenomena is it's very difficult to measure. So to illustrate with some videos, um, here are some, these are like 10 second clips. And in some cases you can see it's pretty clear. Um, so in this case, uh, if you look at her, you know, most people can look at this and and be like, okay, that's an easy case um, that where she was zoned out or something. This is another easy case where uh, he is pretty much focusedly focused in reading coherently. Uh, and by the way, these are all objectively met, verified by asking them questions about the text when they read, right? So they say they mind watered on you know this page. We later on will ask them a question on that page, and you get that expected negative correlation. Um, here's a little trickier example. In this case. So people have a hard time figuring out what happened with that cue as she looked into the camera, and about half the time they guess it, they guess correctly or incorrectly. And here's another example where it's a little difficult to figure out uh, what's going on. 
And so people have a hard time understanding how to interpret that gesture. Um, so here's where they get confused. So the, the message here is that in many cases, the behavioral cues that people exhibit are actually not very good at reliably detecting whether somebody is zoning out. So um, as I'll show you later, there's limited utility to uh, looking at behavioral measures. So, uh, and that makes sense, right? Because why we've kind of evolved to hide these cues. Why would I want to show you that I'm zoned out, A, and B, you don't know you're zoning out yourself sometimes, right? You have to catch yourself zoning out. So um, eye tracking is a good way to uh, figure out uh, what happens um, because eye tracking reveals kind of the locus of visual attention, right? And the, and the, and the understanding is something like this. When you're, when you're actually engaging in anything normally, reading or doing whatever, there is a dance, a movement between what's happening in the world and how your eyes are moving, right? But when you're decoupled, you, that association should break down because you're not actually engaging and processing. So your motor system, your, 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 eye, your ocular motor control systems cannot actually tell you where to move your eyes. So just to give you an example, uh, here is a person, uh, she's watching that film I was telling you about, um, and that green dot is actually um, her eye movements. And in this case, you can see she's kind of tracking that balloon. That's called a smooth pursuit movement because you're kind of pursuing an object. And so I, we look at eye tracking to look at mind wandering because it's one of the most reliable measures, but it's also very noisy. So look in this case, um, you can see she's, uh, yeah, so you're there. You know, they're chasing the horse and and so on. Um, so uh, here's a kind of a simple pipeline. Uh, this is old work uh, to maybe five years ago to just uh, build a model of mind wandering. So we had a person, we had some people read about 132 people read about a, read a text page by page. And whenever they caught themselves mind wandering, they hit a space bar. That was it. And they uh, actually, uh, excuse me, they did that um, about 30% uh, of the time in these data. At the same time, we record eye movements, and it goes through some some basically cleaning where you extract fixation filtering and all kinds of steps. And then there's a very simple machine learning pipeline here. But the important thing is that actually, in many cases, you don't have enough data because the eye tracker is noisy or there wasn't enough data on the page. And um, at almost like 40% of the cases, uh, but you can actually supplement your model predictions with a probabilistic approach that tries to figure out how do I, what is my best estimate given missing data? And that actually greatly boosts accuracy. Here's some main findings. Uh, the models are moderately accurate. So we have a correlations of about 0.4 with respect to self reports. And this graph on the, on the left shows you the, across a given subject, across all subjects, the distributions of self-reported versus model-based predictions. And importantly, these models are trained to generalize across people, right? So they are validated and cross-validated in a way that uh, uh, they give generalizable predictions. Precision and recall are decent. Importantly, the models predict learning outcomes. So in this study, they took a comprehension assessment afterwards, and you can actually see that whatever the model is predicting correlates with that. Uh, they're robust to missing data. And the signature in this case, the, the, we were the, one of the first people to show that having fewer fixations, gaze fixations, but longer fixations actually was the signal of mind wandering. And the reason is that when you're, when you're reading a norm, when you're normally reading, your eye movements are very arrhythmic because you're responding to the text. And how, how you're constructing an understanding of the text is guiding what your movements are. But when you're zoning out, you're just moving in this very rhythmic kind of fashion. Um, and we've actually built similar mind wandering detectors across many other domains and sensors. Um, so for example, we've looked at uh, watching film, interacting with the tutoring system, text, video, looked at gaze, some physio, some facial expressions. And in, in, in average, we get about 20% above chance accuracies, um, which, is, which is, I would call it fair to moderate. So, um, oops. Um, so, okay, well, can we do something? Uh, so now we, you know, had the basic research and the experimental work and we generated some data and built a model. Now, can we use the model for intervention? So here's kind of the general idea is as you're reading from, you know, one, one page to the next, we grab your eye gaze uh, and run it through the, the, mo the model I just showed you. And uh, if you're not mind wandering, uh, you know, it lets you move on. But if you are mind wandering, then it actually asks you a question on that page. Uh, and that question is used to decide, where, and if you answer it correctly, you can move on. But if you don't, uh, you're given an opportunity to kind of reread and re-answer a second question. And the whole idea here is very simple. One, 
you want to bring attention back when somebody is zoned out. And second, uh, you want to co correct any comprehension deficiency. If they're missing something, you want to address it immediately. And the reason being, you know, a text or film or story, you know, it proceeds sequentially. So if you're missing a core piece, you know, in the you know second page, you actually will have a weakened understanding of what's happening as you're going along. In reality, it's much more complicated than that. Um, but this is uh, one, uh, one, one. We've done many of these. But this is one of the interventions. In this case, they read that the text was divided into 15 chunks, sections that were coherent, and then the, we tracked mind wandering in real time and we aggregated per section. And if you decided that you know the, the probability that you're zoning out is pretty high, we'd actually ask them to construct a self-explanation. So here they're actually constructing a response um, based on um, uh, you know a prompt, right? And then we would kind of score that in real time using very simple uh, natural language processing. And uh, based on how they responded, allow them to um, you know move on or have them reconstruct their response, right? Uh, and that was kind of the intervention with a lot of you know there's a lot of ACI to to get right to make this work effectively. So here's an experiment in testing out that intervention. So um, we um, so here's the here's kind of the experiment. So we in one group we had an intervention. So as I said, you know the intervention is self-explanations, which by the way is the most effective thing you could probably do when you're reading. So just having the self-explanations independent of whether they're tied to mind wandering is expected to have learning benefits. So in a control group, we do what's called a yoked control, where for example, if I got um, self-explanation, I got the interventions on concepts, you know, one, three, and five based on my mind wandering. I would be paired with a control participant who would also get them on pages one, three, and five, but it was independent of their mind wandering. So it's a really, really a tight comparison. And uh, so they they read the text in either condition, and then they uh, get an, they take an assessment of what they read immediately after reading, where it's kind of fresh in their mind, and a week later. And this is really what you what you're kind of after, right? Delayed comprehension. Are they really remembering it a week later? And then there's two types of questions, but that's no, that's irrelevant for the current purposes. Um, and this is a measure. This is an effect size. It's just coincidence. So uh, positive numbers mean higher for the intervention, which is the control. So we saw no benefits uh, immediately after reading, uh, but we actually see good benefits for the intervention on both question types uh, a week later. Um, and in this case, um, the effect is um, uh, this is like a, an effect size of about 0.35, you know, which is a kind of small to medium uh, effect. So this is this is kind of promising. So all of this is done in the lab with us with like a you know forty thousand dollar eye tracker, and it's very unpractical. So can we take it into the wild, right? So we said, okay, let's do that. So in this case, we worked with um, uh, these uh, consumer, you know, cheaper eye trackers, the $100. We actually use this eye tribe. It's no longer available, um, but it was like $99. And we actually took it into a biology classroom. So this is a high school biology classroom. They have the fish tank here. And, you know, kids worked on with these computers and these eye trackers, um, you know, uh, an intelligent tutoring system uh, that, uh, taught them, uh, you know, uh, biology content, and it, it, ha it was very interactive. So as you, we're going away from reading to to um, some some lecturing, a lot of scaffolded dialogue. There were also a lot of activities you do there. You build concept maps and all kinds of things. Here's an example of eye tracking, so of one person's eye tracking. So notice these are the fixations, and the the size corresponds to the length of a fixation, which is typically 250 milliseconds. And you'll, you'll imagine, like, you, if you notice, uh, this is just to point out what a, the wonderful world of uh, vision, right? You construct this entire image of this scene when you're actually just sampling these few fixations. So the whole construction is totally, uh, you know, a constructed reality, right? Uh, the reality is you're just you're just sampling this. Um, so uh, anyway, so we uh, here's some key findings. So we showed that you can actually get valid eye tracking data using those really cheap eye trackers with the, with high school students doing all the setup and everything on their own. So that was interesting. And uh, we, um, uh, these attention aware, and we also developed intervention. So the intervention in this case would be, um, if if she she was, this, this tutor was monitoring eye movements every second uh, and running them through a mind wandering model like I did in the previous case. But in this case, uh, if it detected uh, it was it was zoning out, it would like stop what it was said and it would you know call out the student, hey Sydney, um, what what about uh, molecule A and molecule B? Like ask a question, or I would just repeat what it was saying. So the idea there was to get attention back uh, and then correct the comprehension deficiency, and we showed that it had benefits in some context.
So uh, we also did a lot of work on uh, detecting this from video. So even having an eye tracker as an external device um, and so on. So we looked at detecting mind wandering uh, from video and here's kind of the approach that worked decently. So look at overall movement in the, and these, these are 10 second clips. Um, so overall movement uh, in the uh, body and upper body and face. Look at uh, textures. So these are facial textures at key locations around the eyebrows uh, and along the lips. Um, and we could have done the nose, but we didn't. Um, and then some action units, facial action units, uh, you know, lip, jaw, you know, frowns and nods and things like that. Uh, co-occurrence of action units. These are just looking to see what pairs are co-occurring. And these are temporal Gabor filters. You're basically looking at signals at different, uh, you know, uh, temporal frequencies. Um, and uh, the, you know, the models were fair. So as I said, it's really difficult to pick these out from video. Uh, and so the AURCs here, uh, with chance being 0.5, were about 0.6. So you know, it's by no means amazing, but it's good. But to put this in context, we also showed the exact same clips to, these are 10 second clips, to nine MTurk workers, and then took the aggregate of the clips. And you can see in this graph on the, le on the top, top, uh, top right, the computer and humans actually had the same AURCs. Uh, the, the, the AURCs curves intersect, so they're making different precision recall trade-offs, but uh, essentially they were pretty identical. Um, and uh, importantly, um, if you look at the number of humans, uh, this is the computer, right? It took about, uh, uh, you know, it took about at least three humans to tie with the computer. So the computer beat zero, one human or two humans. And if you combine the computer and human results, you get actually a better improvement. So you can think about cases in which the computers are doing an initial scanning and then some human, you know, does a verification. Uh, and, 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 you know, this would be important, I guess, in like high, in, in cases where, you know, they're mission critical, right? So the person at the TSA checking your baggage for explosives and firearms should not be mind wandering, but that's the exact kind of task in which mind wandering is, can be quite prominent. Um, so that's just one example. And uh, lastly, um, it's also possible to estimate uh, gaze features uh, from video. So this is recent work. Um, so typically what an eye tracker does is this infrared light kind of illuminates the eyes and then a camera captures it. And then through basic geometry and you know filtering motion filtering algorithms, you can get a pretty good estimate. But it's possible. Uh, here's an open source program that is we use for facial expression tracking sometimes called Open Face. These green things, these are actually uh, the estimate of the direction vectors of where the eye gaze is occurring. So let me just show you what that might look like. So without some sense of, without some type of calibration, it's basically impossible, not impossible, it's very difficult to take these vectors if you're not doing careful calibration and map them onto um, uh, screen coordinates, right? So, but we said, you know what? We don't really need that. What if we just extracted uh, just fixation? So we don't really care where they look. We just care what are the patterns or dynamics of eye movements. And those are just fixations, like how you, where you're fixating and how are you moving across fixations? So we had an unsupervised kind of uh, algorithm to do that. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but the key findings are features, like seven features that are the most important eye tracking features, like the number of fixations, the fixation duration, and things like that. They, they do pretty decent uh, compared to things measured from a proper eye tracker. So the video-based measure is correlated from about 0.41 to 0.75 for data collected in the lab, where there's a lot of high-quality tracking and precision. And it was lower in the classroom with those very cheap eye trackers um, and very noisy situations, but, you know, still decent. Uh, importantly, both if you train models on the video-based eye tracking and the actual eye tracker, they were pretty much equivalent. Um, but but you can only get a restricted set of features. So it was never as good as training on the whole feature set. And then you can improve it a bit by doing some pre-training. So, and just lastly, in, the, in terms of next steps of what we're looking at now. So, you know, we, I told you we looked at mind wandering, but that's just one little thing in what's actually happening when, you, when you're reading it. A lot of other things going on. And some of those you can get from eye tracking, like you can totally tell if somebody's skimming or not. You can, as I showed you, you can tell if somebody's mind wandering, but it's almost impossible to tell you if somebody is making an inference. So an inference is when you go from the text to memory and retrieve memories. And that's like literally the essence of deep reading deeply, right? Because you want to go beyond the text into the world, into your memories and your experiences. But you can't get that really from eye movements. We don't think you can. So we're coupling eye movements. And here's actually a proper eye tracker. 
uh, with uh, some neurophysiological monitoring. So this is FNIRS, which is basically, uh, you know, you basically shoot uh, infrared, near infrared light uh, through the scalp, and then you can look at the refraction and you can measure whether or not there's blood in the area, which tells you whether there's activation. So it's basically, think about this as what fMRI does, but in an fMRI, you're in a scanner and you can't move, right? So here you can actually be, do much more naturalistic things. The disadvantage is fMRI can give you a whole three-dimensional scan of the brain, but here you only get very much the outer cortex. And in addition, we also have some EEG channels here. Um, so the idea is to couple eye tracking uh, along with what's occurring in the brain to figure out uh, some of these underlying processes and we can see if we can build better models from that. So I'm actually at a natural stopping point before uh, moving on. So if they have questions, this would be a good, good time to take them. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be any, so I guess you can go ahead. Okay, um, so in the interest of time, let me just uh, skip uh, this and move on. I was just gonna talk to you about collaboration. Let me just move on to the uh, institute that we're um, running. Uh, so, uh, uh, so other kind of work we've been doing is part of these large institutes. So one of them is Project Tesserae, and actually, uh, you know, Manman uh, De Chaudhry from Georgia Tech, if you guys may know her, is, is a kind of a co-PI on this. This was a super fun project, uh, but also super stressful, where we did uh, longitudinal modeling of uh, of individuals through wearable sensors uh, in kind of the natural environment. So we studied 757 people, uh, information workers uh, in high stress jobs for a one year period of time using a lot of wearable sensors. And we're going to make all this data available very soon. So just 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 something to keep in mind. Um, and second is another project um, uh, funded by the IES, that's the Institute of Education Sciences where uh, we worked on, uh, and this is a very data-driven project, so you know, you may, you, may, you may hear the word personalized learning just you know, thrown around all over the place, um, but, um, uh, but uh, there's very little evidence base. The, the evidence base on really evaluating the effectiveness of personalized learning algorithms at scale is, is almost non-existent. So this, the, the, the center was supposed to actually figure out, okay, take, let's take a platform, in this case it was called Algebra Nation, that's used by all kids in Florida, that has real, real world implications. So to, to graduate high school in Florida, you have to pass your Algebra One uh, course, which is taken in eighth or ninth grade. And uh, this platform was designed to help people navigate that course, uh, you know, like watch videos and take assessments and things like that. So the idea was, can we uh, basically use the data from people using this in the past years to develop a recommender system and some other kind of reinforcement learning techniques to suggest strategies and, and you know, a learning, a basically personalize the learning experience and then do rigorous experiments to compare that to some control fixed sequencing, right? To really see if personalization works. Um, so we spent a lot of time on this and it's still ongoing. We actually had our main experiment running this spring um, with about 10,000 students uh, before COVID hit uh, because they, the, the dependent variable was the state, the, the score on the state standardized exam, but they canceled that. So we're actually starting over. So the, that's another amazing data source that we've collected, um, you know, that, that at some point we'd wanna, we wanna share because we actually have data from like uh, hundreds of thousands of students here. Um, but I wanna just spend the last few minutes talking about uh, a new National Institute for Student AI Teaming uh, that, that just started when actually in month two. Um, so uh, this is, well, I think one of the, one of five or six or seven institutes they funded this round. Um, and uh, uh, Jamie Gorman, uh, who's a professor in, in psychology at Georgia Tech, uh, who's an expert in team science and team cognition is actually one of the co-PIs on this. Um, so the question we asked is um, how to promote deep conceptual learning through rich social collaborative learning experiences um, for all students. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about the problem, right? So um, one, of the, one of the most effective ways people learn, and this has been documented for the last 40 years, we, you know, we know a few things, is that um, through having rich conversations uh, and centered around authentic problems, uh, so basically social collaborative learning, right? The problem is it's very hard to do this in a classroom. So if you look at if you ever look at a classroom with small group learning occurring, it can be quite chaotic. So you have this teacher running around and you have, uh, you know, groups of students working. Some are on task, some are off task. 
Um, I taught a course, a uh, 106 person course undergrad in, in, in AI last fall, right? And it was, I had the same experience, right? So uh, in every single class, I had some kind of collaborative activity, but there's 50 of them, there's 50 groups and I'm running around and there's two kinds of main problems that occur. One is, um, if you don't know what's happening in individual groups, they can go abstract, they can be stuck. So you're so so you're already losing some of the some of the um, uh, opportunities. But second, sometimes these groups and many times are having amazing conversations. They're looking at the problem in new ways. They're coming up with new perspectives. But all of that is just lost because it's just you know goes up in the ether. So the so so it's both a problem to implement and a missed opportunity. So the way we aim to do that in our institute is through this idea of AI partners. So we look at AI as this social collaborative partner that helps students and teachers work and learn more effectively, engagingly, and equitably. So what this involves is um, imagine, you know, kind of reimagining the role of AI in learning. So the, the last 20 years was kind of intelligent tutoring systems, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, highly structured curriculum. And, and you're ever thinking more in terms of like the AI partners work with small groups of students and they can take on many roles and embodiments. So in the in the case on the left, it's just Alexa or some Alexa like thing that they can ask questions and they can participate in conversations. In the middle, it's like an embodied agent, um, a virtual agent, uh, and they can interact with it. And on the right, it could even be an embodied agent. Um, and the interactions and the, and the AI also takes on different roles. So for example, it could actually be a peer learner. There's some advantages to that. In other cases, it could be a, a coach facilitating things going along. But the main point is to just facilitate and participate in having helping students have kind of these learning conversations that are very carefully centered around extremely carefully de de designed curriculum uh, on certain phenomena. And uh, all the interaction occurs through speech and vision. Um, and the uh, what you see here are, are uh, the other problem is that uh, the teacher is a really an integral part of this whole orchestration, right? So these partners are sending curated metrics back to the teacher, both on you know very simple things like how people are participating, participatory patterns, but also more complicated things. So you can actually do a content analysis of what are the conversations and feed that back. So when you typically have collaborative learning with well-designed curriculum units in a classroom, you have these frequent check-ins. So the groups will work together for like 10 minutes and they all come together for like a five minute discussion and they go on. So imagine those discussions could actually be centered around the actual conversations these kids are having. And the last thing is, um, because an AI partner will stay on for multiple periods of time, uh, you can actually figure out like what is the right context for this little girl, in what groups does she perform better, um, and similarly to kinds of teachers, right? What, what, so anyway, so you can you can track progress over time. So that's kind of like the vision, uh, and uh, it's grounded in some pretty uh, well-established theoretical frameworks uh, of learning, um, and we're also doing this in the context of uh, AI education. So. We're going to integrate AI education, like for example, uh, understanding bias in machine learning uh, within existing courses, within existing science and tech courses. Uh, and there's a lot of measurable learning outcomes that we're looking forward to. So just to give you a little more of the structure of our institute, um, so we want to blend uh, foundational and use-inspired research through broadening participation, workforce development, and community engagement. Um, so we divided our institute into these three, shall we call them, strands. Um, so strand one is really getting into very basic, uh, uh, you know, work in developing social multimodal AI partners that can have conversations. So really advances in multimodal machine learning, natural language processing, and kind of knowledge representation. Um, and so the idea here is that in addition to being able to address the current problem of an AI partner, we should we should be having coming up with algorithms and techniques or, and, and the know-all that can be applied in different contexts. Second uh, is really where it comes into advances in theories, interaction paradigms, and orchestration frameworks. Basically, it's really trying to come up with some foundational work in, in the science of student AI teams. So we've known a lot about 50 years of research on human-human teams. There's uh, emerging research on human agent teams. This is very much of interest to the army and defense, as you can imagine. Um, but but it's a very different principle when you have you know eight, you know ten year olds interacting with AI, right? So what what is what 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 are the frameworks? How do we figure out what what is going on and 
and what can we offer? So that's really looking looking at that as like a more team science HCI kind of contribution. And the last one is um, every time AI has has been entered into uh, you know the conversation, um, there's a there's a large risk and there's a lot of fears and concerns with data and AI of things going wrong, and we also feel that um, personally that the way we've approached technology development in the past is to just go with unbridled development and deal with societal consequences later. And that just is, you know, blows up in your face. So the idea is to really rethink on how to develop these technologies. And we are actually working with some theoretical frameworks, one of them called responsible innovation, in which you really start to say, how do I design things with teachers, parents, students, community stakeholders, uh, you know, working with, uh, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, community advocates to talk about responsible use of data. So really figuring out what are the processes to do this inclusive co-design to empower diverse stakeholders to envision, co-create, critique, and apply AI technology. So basically, uh, you know, considering uh, uh, equity, social justice, ethics, um, up front in the design process and not as afterthoughts and thinking about the frameworks to do that in. So you can imagine they're integrated sort of like this. Um, you know, you, you're, you're blending foundational work, which is kind of in the intersections of one and two and use inspired research, which is the AI partners. So, and that's kind of the intersections of two and three. And then there's a community hub that is essentially the mechanism in which we, you know, integrate participants and, uh, in basically partner organizations. And, and as we we're getting, we're actually spending the next couple of months getting the Institute up and running. And as we actually expand in year two, or, you know, importantly, we want to open it up to new people so people can participate. So just, uh, I can stop now. I have a couple more slides. Just let me know if you want me to stop. I know we have a, we have a hard stop coming up. So should I go on or? Uh, you can go on Sydney. I mean, we have some more time now. But... Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, Institute is, is looking at uh, 29 researchers uh, from 14 areas and across the whole uh, the U.S. and here's you guys uh, in seven. Um, so we actually have these kind of Colorado is like the hub, but we have these local kind of regional corridors that I think once uh, once people can actually meet in person again, it can have this nice blend of having some local interactions uh, with uh, widespread. And we're, working, and we're working with two large school districts, Denver Public Schools and St. Brain Valley Schools. Uh, so uh, the institute aims to engage large numbers of uh, uh, of people. So we are hoping to work with you know 5,000 diverse K-12 students from the two school districts. Uh, about more than 50% are from underrepresented groups, with a large number of 70 teachers. And these are meaningful engagements because the curriculum has. We work with these curricula units that are you know between four to six weeks long. So each engagement is, is sustained over multiple periods of time. Um, and uh, also um, over different years. Uh, so we're gonna hopefully engage a large community, also parents and stakeholders of the community. And again, you know, folks in our universities, because there's nine universities here. So just to kind of end, uh, so the idea is to develop foundational theories and AI technologies, uh, grow a diverse workforce by engaging the future kind of AI researchers and serve as this national nexus point for empowering uh, diverse stakeholders to create these AI technologies. And in the, in the age of COVID, uh, we want to you know, kind of track up, solve a problem, but uh, it, in fact, we can do the whole thing remotely. So we're actually working with um, both in-person as well as remote kind of modes uh, of how to structure these um, learning experiences. So anyway, I hope if, uh, I, I just spoke about one project and not the other, but just to illustrate that how uh, these computational methods can help you understand human functioning. It is in our case, in one case, um, how how people, um, you know, how people process text or, or other narrative materials in a manner that that takes into consideration their attention and their prior knowledge. How you can model those phenomena uh, using machine learning methods and either video-based or different versions of eye tracking, and then how you can use those models. Uh, in interventions uh, to kind of drive drive change, both in the in the lab and in the wild. And we've done this in other areas in in emotion emotion aware technologies, in uh, models that actually go into classrooms and record teacher speech and analyze teacher speech uh, for quality of their discourse. How how well are they at asking questions that spark discussion? And then actually using that information to give feedback to teachers. Um, so we actually have a whole feedback app for that. So that's just some couple of examples. 
Um, let me just end by uh, thanking our team, uh, it's our current team and, uh, and the past members uh, for many years um, uh, and our funders. Uh, so I think that should do it uh, for me. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Sydney, for the nice talk. Uh, so we have one question from Ashok Goyal. Uh, so he asks, he says, uh, Sydney, congratulations on your institute. I wonder if mind wandering is positive or negative, depending on the context. Uh, in TSA, clearly negative, but in learning, might it be part of interactive or constructive learning? Great question. Excellent question. So um, there's a lot of evolutionary advantages to mind wander. Uh, if you're in, uh, a, and there's two, if you're in a situation where, um, you know, you know, in, you're like in a really boring situation, it gives you an escape. If you're in a prison cell, it lets you escape. Uh, if you're in pain, it lets you escape. Uh, so there's absolutely clear evolutionary advantages. Um, there's some research in learning linking the trait of daydreaming with more creative problem solving, but that's a trait. But if you actually have people do creative problem solving and you actually measure mind wandering, uh, it's, it's negatively related. So I think the important point is uh, how do we measure mind wandering? So it's very careful how, we, how it's defined. If you're reading and you're actually, or, or you're processing a lecture and you're, 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 you're thinking about you're activating memories and thoughts pertaining to the content, we actually would not call that mind wandering. So you can leave the immediate text and you can make inferences. That's exactly what you should be doing. That is not mind wandering. The way it's defined is really, um, is really just a matter of uh, completely off task, unrelated thoughts. That said, um, what is the correlation between mind wander? How much of mind wandering is does it take for your learning to have a to, to you know have be negative? A, a few amount is not is not a problem. Uh, I don't think we understand quite necessarily the dynamics and whether there's a curvilinear in the relationship and things like that. So that part is 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 unknown. Um, Great, thanks. Uh, so I had another question here. Uh, I mean, in your collaborative uh, teaming effort. Uh, what kind of data sets or, or data you will, you are planning to collect, right? So, so you you give a very nice uh, 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 presentation on how you are using the eye tracking technology, for example. So, are there other kinds of uh, data sets you are planning to yeah, let me, uh, use? Let me, again. That's a great question. I wanted to show this to you, um, but uh, that's okay because I have some videos that would be that will basically answer this question. Uh, some of the data sets we've collected are um, this is this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is um, uh, couples they're having conversations about stressors, um, and we actually recorded uh, their conversations and their facial expressions and built some models on them. Um, here's another one. In this case, uh, folks are um, doing a visual search task, and we actually measure the gaze of six people or five people, and then everybody sees each other's gaze. And the idea is, can people use eye gaze to navigate how they na to to organize how they navigate the search space? Oops, I'm trying to play this. Um, in this one, sorry, in this one, um, people are negotiating and we're actually looking at eye movements. But the ones that are more relevant is this one. So this is a more problem solving case. In this case, they're working with Minecraft and they are given a very complex problem. And these are novice computer programmers and they're using this blocks kind of world. And they're given a problem to like build a brick building and it's go over water and they have to use like two or three if statements and they have to do it in 15 lines of code or less. And it's just recorded over Zoom. Some reason. The, let me just try this again, because um, it's be helpful to see the video. But yeah, I apologize. For some reason, the video is not playing. But That's but fine. anyway, the data. Yeah, yeah the, the data in this case is um, video. They have eye tracking. They have speech. There's things occurring in the environment. Um, and it's a very, very rich source of information because you have people have to coordinate with each other, coordinate a shared mental model, coordinate with the screen, uh, and all kinds of things. Okay. Cool. And uh, so Luis uh, Castri Cato asks a clarification question that uh, are you recording couples in the same room at the same time or are they in different? Uh... And that's that's a data set I didn't collect. It was collected by colleagues at uh, Arizona State. They're in the same room. They actually face to face, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's supposed to simulate like a couples therapy session. Um, okay. And basically, the kind of modeling we did there was uh, we would we would basically like learn a model that would produce uh, 25 kind of facial landmarks in real time, 
of one couple from the other. Um, so it was um, it was being able to use models to, uh, and, and we looked at that from a theoretical perspective of as understanding co-regulation among couples. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Sydney. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, okay. I was on mute. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say thanks a lot for your time and great talk. I mean, I, I think probably you won't hear everyone clapping virtually, but uh, huh. we're all yeah. Time. Thanks for good. inviting me. It was good talk to you guys. Great. Thank you. Thanks again. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for for participating in today's seminar. So uh, keep an eye out for the next ones. Thank you.